It's my desire to live for him tonight. Is that your desire? Honey, you're still my favorite singer. That's so wonderful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remain standing for the word of Yahweh. It's going to go forth tonight. He's having to use a pitiful vessel because I've still got all this junk up here. So I feel sorry for y'all that have to listen to me tonight, but I just couldn't not preach tonight. It's been a whole week, and for me, that's like a, a year. Hallelujah. Preaching is my life. It's what I was born to do. Thank you, Elder. If I told you I was going to my favorite book of the Bible, where would I be going? Hallelujah. Book of Revelation chapter 14. We're just going to make a little pit stop in Revelation because I want to recapitulate a little of where we've been before Passover. Of course, when Passover started, it interrupted our flow a little. Uh, we've been preaching a song that the angels cannot sing. And we did that for about seven weeks. I'm trying to get through it. So I'm glad tonight we can finally return to that and finish up a few of the verses in the book of Song of Solomon tonight. But uh, this series has blessed my soul so much. I've gone back and listened to the sermons again myself Amen. because there's so much richness in these sermons Amen. about the, the new song of the Lord. Wow. And if you are not familiar with this series, I recommend you go to FHTV.TV and watch the entire series. We started this series in the book of Revelation chapter 14, and I just want to go back there real quickly. And read verse number three. Are you there? Say amen. amen. And they sang. Somebody say they sang. They sang. If you wonder why we sing so much in church, it's all through your Bible. Come on. We can say that about our church. And they sang and they kept on singing and they sang some more. And they sang. Amen. <laughs> And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and the elders. And no man, I love that, no man, no human, no son of Adam, no son of an animal, no human could learn this song. Except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Oh, hallelujah. Right. Oh, hallelujah. Verse number five. Thank you, Father. In their mouth, the ones that sing in this new song, was found no guile. For they are without fault. Before the throne of Yahweh. Now I know all your life you heard that Yahshua is the only one without sin. But I just read to you a verse that says there's going to be 144,000 that have the same testimony. Have you ever thought about that? They are without no guiles in their mouth. What was it? What was said about Yahshua? No guile was in his mouth. Amen. And he was without sin. Come on, that's right. Well, I'm looking at 144,000 others with the exact oh. same testimony. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Vaughn, how could that be? It's very simple. You either believe in the power of water baptism or you don't. Come on. See, I believe that water baptism is a lot more than getting wet. <clears throat> I believe you literally come up a new creation. That you're baptized for the remission of your what? 
and that when you come up, you are without fault before the throne of God. Amen. That's why, brothers and sisters, we are learning a new song. You may be seated. When I started this series, I, I, I've never heard anyone be able to explain what this new song is. I've listened to the greatest preachers in Pentecost, charismatic, and I've never heard anyone explain what the new song was. And it was then that I began to examine what a song is. A song is an expression of your life experience. Dottie Rambo said that she dreaded writing a new song. Do you know why? Because she probably just had to go through the song. When she sang in the valley, he restoreth my soul, it's because she was in the valley where he was restoring her soul. Your song is your life. And this is not you learning a new song. This is you living a new life. And from that life, it's singing a song. Now some of you in this room, you ask the Lord to teach you the new song. How many, remember when we started this series, I said, who wants to learn the new? I want to know all four verses, three stanzas, the bridge, and all the courses. I want to know how to harmonize on it, how to ruminize, and how to traumatize. I want it all. But you didn't understand, did you? There's no words to this song. There are some people that sing a song like this. On a hill far away. All right. I grew up in a church that sings it like this. On a hill far away. A song is not about lyrics. It's about feeling. And in this life that you have been called into, you are going to have to learn the feelings if you want the testimony without guile. If that's the testimony you want, your life will have to experience what the first man experienced that sang this song. You want to sing the song, you've got to live the life. Because the life is in the song and the song is in the life. There is a group of people, 144,000. Now that's not a literal number. Y'all know that, right? I've trained you. Go watch my class if you're live on the 144,000. Now speaking of 144. Hallelujah. <laughs> speaking of 144. Ah, Elder Morgan told me last night, he said, Pastor, I went and measured that sand lot where you're going to build the tabernacle. And he said, if you go wide with it, from edge to edge, it's 144. Wow. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> It's 12 times 12. 12 is the number of divine government. And when you bring 12 to its highest power, you come to 144. God's numbers are all over that property. God is doing something bigger than our own imagination. Hallelujah. If you're going to be in that 144, you've got to learn the song. So then I said, well, Lord, where is this song written at? He said, it's already been sung 
Because this is the song of songs. Think about it. If no man can learn this song except a select group, then that means somebody sang it before you did. And indeed, we found the song in the song of songs, the song of Solomon. So we're going to pick up there in chapter 2. Bear with me tonight. My head is not really, I probably shouldn't be preaching, but I'm trying to get through it. Hopefully you can glean from it something tonight. Hallelujah. Song of Songs, chapter 2. We, it took us seven weeks to do chapter 1. I'm going to try to get through chapter 2 if I can. Let's pick up where we left off. Verse 7 is where we left off. It says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken my love until it pleases. Verse 8 is where we're picking up tonight. The voice of my beloved. Now this is the bridegroom. This is the bride speaking about the bridegroom. And she says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains and skipping up on the hills. I want to preach tonight and help you to understand what verse 8 is truly saying. Notice that leaping and skipping. So here's the bride and she now sees her groom as a robe. A deer, Sister Tilly, that does not live in the city where she lives. Now you're going to have to follow me tonight. She said, I see a row and it's the voice of my beloved. And when I look out there, because he never dwells here. Come on, wow. The row is always out there. And uh, before she saw the row, she heard the voice. Somebody's going to get it here in a minute. She said, I heard the voice of my beloved and behold, he comes leaping and skipping up on the hill. So here's my question to you tonight. What did she hear that caused her to see this skipping and this leaping. First of all, skipping and leaping always represents new life. Matter of fact, how many remember when Mary was pregnant with John the Baptist? What happened when life came into the room? The Bible said he... Amen. Whenever... Uh, in the Luke chapter 6 and 23, it says to leap for joy. Because if you ever go into a church where they're not leaping and skipping, there is no joy in that church. Leaping and skipping is life. Anytime the Holy Ghost enters your womb, you're going to leap. Anytime. You're going to skip. You're going to run. Any church that does not have leaping and skipping is not a true church. It's not a true church. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if you're not leaping and skipping, then you are dead. Oh, you may be a Christian, but you're a dead Christian. Why do you think when I walked in here tonight, I looked around and said, what's going on in my church? I don't, I don't know how to act if you're not leaping and skipping. Why? Because I know if you're not leaping and skipping, something's dead inside of you. I know it's been too long since you've been to church. Come on. Because the remember there was but 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 there was something that
that had to happen before she got the leap or the skill. She had to hear the voice of the word. The voice of my beloved, my beloved is Yahshua. He is the word. You hear me and hear me well. The reason, how many of you have ever been listening to me preach and all of a sudden you felt like leaping and skipping. It's because you heard the voice of my beloved. You heard the voice of the end time message and it made you leap and skip. You heard, she heard the revelation of the word. Notice what she said, I hear a voice, hold on. She didn't see the leaping yet. You hear me and hear me well. Your leap, oh, now see, now let me take something back. Now let me back up a minute. There are some churches today, I call them jumping jack churches. People are jumping. They are. But here's the problem. If you're leaping to music, Instead of the word, your leap won't last. Your jump won't last. You got to jump at the word. You got to leap at the revelation of truth. Only there will you be a leaper forever. Leaping at the word. The voice of my beloved. She said, I heard the voice. I didn't see him yet. But I was in my little Baptist church. Yeah. I was just down there at my house and I heard a voice. I turned on YouTube and I heard a voice. And it was the voice of truth. And all of a sudden my heart started leaping. And I started running inside. I said, hold on. Something's waking up my leaper. Something's waking up my skipper. There's life in the voice of my beloved. I heard the voice. And then when I heard the voice, I started looking for where the voice was coming from. And I looked out over the horizon. And I saw my Messiah, my elder brother, my Lord, my King. I looked out there and I saw something in him. He was just like, how many of you saw that movie, uh, Dancing with Wolves? Anybody ever seen that movie? Well, the reason Kevin Costner had to dance with wolves is because if he would have run, they would have chased him. And if he would have stood still, they would have killed him. But because he entertained them with his leaping and his skipping, they had to sit back and say, why are you dancing? Why are you leaping when you should be scared out of your mind? You should be ready to give up. You should be running for your life. But there's a leaper in you. There's truth in you. Nothing can stop. Kevin, don't you know, son, we could kill you? That's why I can't stop you. Because you'll get me. Ah, that's why I can't. I, I, I can't see. When I walk in this church and I see you not leaping, I know the wolf's already got you, darling. I already know you're in trouble. ever listen to me I can get people to believe against the trinity quicker than I can to get them to dance that ought to tell you where the power is at there's something in that leaping and there's something in that skipping that looks a lot like that man on the hills up there he's always leaping and skipping because he is the word and the life is in him
Do y'all not know I could walk in this church? Sit down right there with the rest of you. Just have church. You ever thought why? Look at me. I'm fat. You think I want to get you to leap it? You know what I have to go through to leap? Do you understand? That's a lot of weight to get off the ground. But I have learned what you're doing externally is what you're doing internally. I'm fighting so that when I'm dead and gone, you will never let go of your leaping and your skipping. However, if you're only leaping and skipping because everybody else is, it won't last. But if you're doing it because you heard the voice of my beloved. Oh, and it put a joy unspeakable inside of me. All through the Bible, leaping and skipping is the symbol of life. As a matter of fact, when the man was healed at the pool of Bethesda, the Bible said he started leaping into the temple. Come on now. You listen and listen well. You're not allowed in the house of Yahweh without dancing. I'm going to tell you what. There are some that act like you don't believe me. So I want to tell you, go home and study Psalms 150. And then ask yourself, did I obey the pattern? There's only one way you were allowed to enter the sanctuary. And it's spelled out for you. And guess what's not in there? That's not in your Bible. No, no, your church taught you how to do that. If you get in your Bible, you'll become a leaper and a skipper. Why? Because the word will make you leap. Whenever you see, the, when I, I was watching the video of me preaching at uh, Unleavened Bread at the downtown center, and while I'm preaching, the whole congregation takes off running. You know what that was, right? You heard the voice of the beloved. And you saw him leaping and skipping on the hills. Now, why is he leaping? I want to show you why. Because Karen, before we married, just to listen to her voicemail. Yeah. I wanted to hear the voice of my beloved. She didn't even have to answer. I just wanted to hear the voice. And it caused me to leap and skip. When you lose your leap and your skip, you're in trouble. You're in trouble without it. So he's up there leaping and skipping. Why? He's on the hills. He's not down there with her. What's he doing? Saying, come up here. There's life up here. Nobody's crying up here. Nobody's complaining about their problems up here. Nobody's talking about how somebody did them wrong up here. Oh, no, we got life up here on this mountain. He's inviting her to come with him. Let's read the next verse. Verse 9. He's skipping up on the hills. My beloved is like a young stud. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows and he's gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and do what? Come away. I want to talk to you about that. 
Where is this row? He's on a mountain called the mountain of Bashir. The mountain always represents solitude. Remember, Yahshua went up to a mountain to pray. Moses would always go up a mountain to be alone with God. Once you hear the truth, you'll start hearing the call to come and be alone with God. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. How do you hear it? Why do you see the seduction of your Savior? Because He sent you His voice first. You heard a message. But after you hear the truth, you'll start being seduced. At first you get a voice. You hear a sermon that sounded, that sounded different. I like that. That's the voice of my beloved. You heard the truth. But what, listen to me, if you ever make the mistake of listening to the voice, it won't be long. You'll be seduced by the Savior. He sends you the voice just to get you to look to the mountain. He sends you the voice to get you to look beyond where you are. He, he figured if you can hear the truth, you'll get your eyes off of your pitiful situation. And you'll begin to look under the hills from whence cometh. He's calling you to come away. But you, won't, but you don't get the call to come away until you hear the voice of the beloved. And only if you respond to the voice will you then get the call to come away. Hallelujah. Now, notice... The mountain is the hundredfold. It's the inner court, the holy of holies. You're in the outer court, in the thirtyfold. But you keep seeing something in that door that's sort of just a shadow walks by every once in a while. Come on. And all you were fine. See, here's the deal. You were fine in the outer court. Y'all was having church out there. What do you think they're doing in the outer court? They're killing, sacrificing animals. They're worshiping. They're all saved. Just as saved as you are. Y'all want you to hear me. Them 30 folds just as saved as you are. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> oh, they're all at the last great day. We're going to get the same reward at the end we get at the beginning. It's all you all going to get salvation. But there are a few that he sent out a voice and you heard it and you turned and looked in that inner court. You saw something walk by and you said, I wonder what's in there. And, and, and then all of a sudden that shadow comes by again and you're like, hey, there's something more than being saved. What's in the outer court? The brazen altar. Salvation. And water baptism. Oh, now, what is it? The labor in the 30-fold court? Water baptism? So we got you saved. We got you baptized. But I know of people that's in that outer court and they heard a voice and it's seducing them to come a little higher, go a little deeper, reach a little higher, believe a little stronger. And you said, what's in there? And you look, and you see a menorah. Look at that light. That's the light of truth. It's illuminating the darkness. It will expose my sin. And you hear something say, come in here. 
And you're like, oh, I don't know. I, out here I'm pretty well hidden in the darkness, in this outer darkness. Outer darkness is not hell. Outer darkness is the outer court. There was no light out there. But you were still saved. So there you are. You're out there. You're saved. But you're enjoying your salvation in the dark. I'm preaching you're not listening now. Some of you were saved in the dark. <laughs> oh yes you were. You were saved in the dark. <laughs> walking around in darkness but you peeked your head and saw a great light in the inner court the menorah of almighty Yahweh calling you in what is the new song anybody that's experiencing this is experiencing the song You're already singing it if you're living it. Notice this is a song men cannot sing. Only the Elohim, the sons of Yahweh, only they are singing this new song, experiencing this new life, walking in this new wonderful way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice, he came down to her to tease her, but he had no plans of staying with her. Oh, hallelujah. He came down the mountain just enough to where she could see him. But he said, as I'm lipping and skipping, he basically he said, if you're tired of crying down there, if you're tired of your pity party down there, if you're tired of your negativity down there, up here there's life. You can come up here. Well, come a little higher. Here's what he said. He came down there and she heard his voice. She saw him leaping and skipping. But then he said these words to her. No, we can't stay here. We can play here a little bit. But we can't stay here. I love you enough to come down to your level. But the problem with today's church they want God to come to their level. When God says, I didn't come down to your level to stay on your level. I came to your level so you would go back on my level with me. He said, we can't stay here. I want to show you something in verse 9. My beloved is like a young stud. Behold, he stands behind our wall. Somebody say our wall. He is looking through the windows. So he's sort of like a little peeping Tom. You know why he's having to look through the windows? Because he don't plan on coming in the house. He has no intentions of coming in your mess. He has no intentions of coming on your level. He has no intentions of coming in there. But he said, if you'll listen to my voice, I will call you out. Hallelujah. But there's a line in verse 9 that troubled me. Our wall. The Lord spoke to me, said she was operating under the spirit of deception. I said, why? He said, that was never our wall, it was her wall. But she was so deceived, she thought. I want you to hear what I'm about to teach you now. 
He said, in that house where she was at, in that religion where she was at, she began to think the walls holding her in was our wall. She thought because my spirit was moving in her house, in her church, that that building and that denomination was ours. She was so deceived, she believed I was in that wall. He said because she saw me looking in the windows of her church, she thought I was approving of her church because I would drop by and let my spirit fall on them and let them hear my voice. She began to think that her wall was our wall. The thing that was holding her, the thing that was separating us, she misidentified it as our religion, our church, ours, ours, ours. He said, I didn't build that wall. But now you've put my name on your wall. the message he's got for you tonight you have become so enamored by the your wall I don't care if that wall is a Baptist wall or a Catholic wall I don't care if it's a Pentecostal or a charismatic wall. If he didn't build it, quit calling it his. Come out, come out of her, my people, and take my name off of it. It ain't my wall. It's that wall that's separating us. But she was so deceived, she thought he helped her build the wall. Know why she was deceived, Sister Lori? Because she saw him looking through the wall, right. checking on him. You know why? Because he loved everybody inside that yes, wall. Sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Here he comes looking in because he knows his people stuck in there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come out of her. Yes, sir. My, my people. Amen. But Amen. there's her is the wall That's right. That's right. of your religion. The one that won't allow you to hear the truth I teach because it don't line up with your religion. That's your wall. However, you did hear the voice of truth. Some of you watching me right now that's that stuck in your churches. You heard the truth. And, you, and listen, you think because he peeps his head in, But what you don't understand about this deer, there are some people on the other side of that wall that he wrote their name down before he created the world. He knows where they are. He knows they're the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And he's peeking in to get them out. My God from Mount Zion, he's peeking in to pull them out. This is the new song. She's bound behind a wall. She heard truth. The voice of my beloved. I'm preaching tonight. She heard the voice. But there was something so secure about that wall. All her friends... Mama, daddy. She knew how to have church behind that wall because she had been trained there. She knew when to say amen behind that wall. She knew when to run the aisle behind that wall. But see, one day she said in verse 8, I heard the voice. Oh, my God, speak to us tonight. 
And then she said, I saw him leaping and, and then I saw him come down and peek in the window and look through the lattice. Hallelujah. He said, come out. Come and play with me. Come leap with me. Come skip with me. There are some of you watching me right now. You have heard me teach you what day the Sabbath day is. You heard the voice. You heard that your church had adopted Catholicism with, the, with presenting the worship and getting rid of the Sabbath. You heard that voice. And for a little while, you even saw that truth leaping on the hills. But what happened was, you were hoping the deer would come inside your wall instead of you going out of your wall to find the deer. I'm preaching to you tonight. Come in here where I'm comfortable. After all, you visit the wall all the time. We had a great move of the Holy Ghost just last service because you peeked through the wall. He said, I wasn't coming for them. I was coming for you. Glory to God. He said, the reason I blessed that wall because you was behind it. The reason I blessed it is because you was behind it. I'm looking for a bride. I wish I felt like preaching tonight. Hallelujah. What was this wall doing stopping her from going to the mountain? Sister Pat, she heard the truth. She heard that there was no place called heaven that she was going to. But she heard that there was a throne that she was going to sit on and rule with Christ here on earth. Over, She heard that truth. And it sounded so good. It made sense. Then she heard there was only one God that the Trinity doctrine was alive and it sounded good. It made sense. But there was a problem. She had built a Trinity wall. There was a problem. She had built a heaven wall. Goodbye world, goodbye. She plans on flying away. She heard truth. She heard about the house of Israel. That she was not a Gentile. She heard it. But it was too hard to leave the building. A few days ago, as I was wor worried about a few situations with this church and our future here, and in my mind, my wife and I were talking, trying to figure out how we're going to secure the building and how, and I left the house and I'm riding down the road. And I called my wife. I said, the Holy Ghost just spoke. He said, I'll, he said, let the dead bury the dead. I'll get you out of Babylon one way or the other. Don't worry about anything. If you got to go have church in a barn, I'm going to provide for my people no matter what. There's nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of. Our shepherd leads this flock. I'll preach in a barn if God will be there. I said, I'll preach in a barn if God will show up. Why? Because I plan on pleasing him. Come out. Come out. Come out. He puts horses in a barn and we're royal horses.
Folks, listen to me. He's been looking inside your wall for a long time. What is the wall? Religion. Fear of truth. Fear of being misunderstood. I had a phone call today from a family member. I realize I'm live, so I'll say this carefully. And the family member said, I have a lot of respect for you. And I know you know the Bible. But can I ask you a question? I said, absolutely. Why are you bringing everybody back to the law? And at that moment, they didn't mean anything bad. It was a serious question. And I didn't take any offense at all. I don't mind questions. I don't like disrespect, but I don't mind questions at all. And at that moment, I realized I had been misunderstood. And I asked the family member a question. I said, let me ask you something. I said, can you show me one scripture in the New Testament where there's no law? Can you show me a scripture in the New Testament where you could preach against homosexuality? And I made them, they're, they're thinking. I said, I'm talking about specifically, without question, that's what it means. There is one that talks about natural affection, but you can interpret that any way you want to. I said, is there a scripture in the Bible against homosexuality? Oh, yes, there is. Where is it? Deuteronomy? I said, uh-uh. That's the law. Boy, he began to get quiet. And I said, can you show me one scripture where, where, where a woman should dress like a woman and a man should dress like a man? I sure can, Leviticus. I said, "Uh uh-uh. You're taking people back to the law. And we went down the list. When we were finished, he realized he had misunderstood me. We're not bringing people back to the law. We're bringing people back to obedience to God. Call it whatever you want to. Call it whatever you want to. But if that fear of being misunderstood, that fear encaptures you. There are preachers today that think they know what I preach and they don't. There's a fear that comes around you, a wall. And it's so hard to explain sometimes what you believe that it's easier to go back in the wall where you don't have to explain nothing. Everybody believes the same thing. Absolutely. And the fear that Elder Morgan just said, the fear that you could be wrong, what happens is you get so comfortable in being right. But now that fear begins to take over you. And you go hide now back there behind a wall. And when truth calls you, and as that conversation continued, I I asked the man, I said, sir, good family member, and I hope he's don't get hurt if he's watching. I said, I want to ask you a question, Brother Michael Mahalik. I I told him, I said, would you tell me what sin is? He said, well, smoke it. I said, no, that's not a sin. That's a weight. That's a weight that you need to get rid of. But what does the Bible say is sin? First John, now this is in the New Testament. That sin is the transgression of the law. So, If the law is done away with, we got a big problem. As a matter of fact, we need to shut the church down because there's no purpose for the church anymore. There's no more sinners in the world. 
So when somebody tells y'all, y'all going back to the law, you need to look at them and say, you're absolutely right. We hope you'll come with us because that's where you can find peace for your soul. And by the time that call ended, you can imagine. Amen. Here's what I have found. That fear, that wall of discomfort, will begin to surround you. Turn with me to Revelation 3. We're going to close in a moment. Revelation 3, 19. I want to make all of you a promise. I want you to hear me, those watching live and those here tonight. I want to make you one promise. If I could not defend everything I teach you, I wouldn't lead you out of that wall. You're safe here. I promise you, you're safe. Whenever the Lord began to teach this message to me, I said, I want to know it good. I want to know what I believe. And I promise you, congregation, do you know why nobody will debate you. You're walking in truth. They'll run you down behind your back and they'll call other people about how weird your new, your new faith is, but they won't call you because you've been trained well. Amen? They can't nobody argue what they say is. Nobody. Nobody. Even those that don't believe in the Sabbath day will tell you Saturday's the Sabbath day. Now they will try to argue it's not necessary anymore, but they run into a bigger problem if they do that. Because brothers and sisters, I can show you in all the major prophets where during the millennial reign, we will be keeping the Sabbath day holy and every other day we will be working under our own vineyard Revelation 3, 19. As many as I love, I beat them to death. Did you know your Bible said that? It basically says that. I chastise them. I beat them. Oh yeah, I whoop them with ten switches. Because I love them. I don't want my boys thinking they girls and my girls thinking they boys. I'll beat it out of them. I don't want my boys wearing no high heels. I love them too much to tolerate them. I don't believe in toleration. I don't believe in tolerance. Do you know why people want you to believe in tolerance? Because they've gotten so degraded. The last step in society is when you begin to tolerate shameful things. We do not tolerate sin. We preach against it. We stand against it. We declare it. Verse 19. Repent. Behold, I stand at the wall and knock. If any man, what? If you hear the voice of my beloved. It's the same verse, y'all, different book. I'm at the wall and I'm talking. Not outside the wall. I'm, I'm not in the wall. I'm talking outside. I'm knocking. I'm looking through the window. I'm looking through the lattice. See, same story. And if anyone hears the message and opens up their mind, then I'll start leaping on the heels for them 
and skipping and we will eat together and then together we will go up to the mountain of Bashir and I will feed you if you'll come out of that building. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the 144,000. Do you know why Yahweh knocks on the door of the church? Do you know why? Because you was in there. Do you know why the Holy Ghost shows up in Babylon and heals the sick? Do you know why he shows up and still does miracles? You know why he does it? That's him leaping, trying to show out for you. That's him skipping, showing off like a robe. Because he said, I am there to call you out. That's what he's doing tonight for those that's listening to me that can't make up your mind what you want to do. The true bride of Christ will embrace her separation. Your loneliness is your loftiness. Whenever you decide to leave the building, when you decide to come out of Babylon, your first separation that you're going to have to go through is the pride of truth. Because your truth was your wall. Do you know that your truth is your security? Brother Larry, the greatest fear that I have and that you have is the fear of being wrong. Do you know why that is, Brother Patrick? Do you know why we fear being wrong? Because if we're wrong, our building crumbles. We built a building, Sister Viretta. We built that building. And it's our, it's our truth. It's what Mama taught us and Daddy taught us and aunts and grandma, what everybody taught us. We built a wall out of it. And we feel good there. And if you come along, Elder Connolly, and take one brick out of that wall, if I allow you to prove me wrong about one brick, and that scares me to death. So what do I have to do? I can't let you touch it. And that's why somebody can send you my video and you're like, oh, no, I've heard him before. No, no, thank you. I'm good. I don't want to hear that. Why? Because the last time I heard him, I started thinking that makes sense. And I can't afford to do that again. Yeah, you heard one video and you said, huh. And you're like, oh, no, oh, oh never mind. No, what? No. Now, but if you're destined to hear it, if you're predestined to hear that word, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to hear that message and you're going to go to bed with it ringing in your brain. You're going to wake up saying, "Where I, I need to, where's my crack at? I need more crack. I need more of that. That's my new addiction. My new addiction is that voice, that truth. The Bible said the word is like honey. That's a sugar addiction. Where's my sugar? You better believe it. Now I'm going to teach you all something. I'm going to teach you now why the wall, it was a wall, but it turned into lattice. Because somebody moved one brick. And then another brick. And then another brick. And then another brick. And now you can see. Now you can see. Now you can feel the pull. Because you was willing to be wrong. It 
it was a wall. Now it's lattice. It's full of holes. How many remember? How many of you remember when your truth started getting full of holes? You said, "Oh God, no, not another one." God, get me out of here! No, I done fell into a cult. Move me, my God! No, not another one. Please put it back. Now you see your beloved through a lattice. You couldn't remember when it was a wall. You couldn't see him. You could only hear him. You heard him, but you couldn't see him. But as one brick moves and another, all of a sudden you're like, oh God, I really can't stay here much longer. Oh, I went to church and I heard the same sermon I heard a thousand times. I knew exactly what they was going to say. But out there, there's life in the Word. I see life. And all of a sudden, it'll begin to take over you. You'll wind up selling everything you got. You'll wind up calling a realtor. You'll wind up packing up. Don't even know where you're going to live. All you know is you heard a voice and it was leaping on the mountain and skipping on the hill and you had to follow it wherever it went I'm going to try to finish now I wish I felt like preaching this hallelujah if I could preach I'd preach this thing hallelujah chapter 10 no chapter 2 verse 10 My beloved spoke. The more I looked through the lattice, the more he spoke. And said to me, get up. My love, my fair one, and come away. Remember, the row is not found in the city streets. In the hustle and the bustle of a carnal mind. He's always beside the still waters, leaping and skipping. Verse 11, for see, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The darkness of your religion, you're free now. The winter is past. You were in that church freezing to death. The winter is past. And the storms of your struggle, whether I should stay, whether I should go, it's over now because now you've got the holes in the wall. Now you know it's a matter of time. You can't stay much longer. Your winter's almost over. Your storm's almost past. Are you ready to go? Verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. In other words, it's a new season. It's a new day. Oh, the newness of the word. There's little, there's little new flowers growing inside of you. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, the winter's over. Where you was just dead in religion, all of a sudden there is some flowers growing in your mind. You have never in your life looked forward to Bible study. But there's some flowers coming up. All of a sudden that book that was so dead to you, Kristen, all of a sudden it becomes a living creature. Where used to you would read those verses and it was ink on paper. All of a sudden it's new flowers springing up in my life. All of a sudden you begin to see because he's revealing it to you. There's new flowers. And now he says, let's protect those flowers. Come away. Because if you go back in there, that your flowers is going to die. 
Some of you watching me right now, you left Passover. You left unleavened bread. You had flowers popping up all over you. And somebody drugged you back to your church. And now your flowers are dying up. I want you to hear me. You can't grow two gardens. You got to come away with me if you're going to flow in the new realm. He wants to protect her new flowers and bring her to a place where the roses never fade. There's a place in God, Sister Holly Durfee, where the roses never fade. Oh, your emotions don't go in and out. You're not up one day and down the next. No, you've come away where there's only skipping and leaping up on the hills. The singing of birds, that's the joy of the word that's coming out of you. And all of a sudden, what does he say? The voice of the turtle dove can be heard in our land. Do you know what that means? Listen to what it means. Finally. Finally. You're moving from just an old robin to a turtle dove. Because the turtle dove Mates for life. The little robin may go in anybody's little nest and mess around. But not the turtle dove. The turtle dove finds her beloved. And they never depart. They fly together. You're going to get to a point with the God where you become a turtle dove. No more backsliding in you. No more adultery in you. No more looking for another. It's all, no, you found the one my soul longeth for. You found the joy of the turtle dove. He's calling you to come out of that bird nest and be a turtle dove. Hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land. Verse 13. The fig tree puts forth her green figs. You know why, don't you? She's decided to leave. All that time he's trying to seduce her. And now she's ready. So he says, now you're going to have new flowers. Fig trees are going to bloom. And the blossoming vines are going to spread their fragrance. Rise up, my love, my beautiful one. Leave that old winter church. Leave that old dead religion and come away. Oh, my dove, verse 14. Oh, my dove. This is the first time he calls her a dove. Oh, my dove in the clefts of the rock in the secret stairs of the cliff. Let me see your face. Now let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet. Your face is lovely. I'm getting ready to close. I'm tired. But I want to tell you what this means. How did she become a dove? She was just an old blackbird. She was just an old chicken in a barnyard barnyard called religion. How did she become a turtle dove? It's very simple. Because she started dwelling in the cleft of the rock. <laughs> she was separated. The cleft of the rock is a private place. She was pulled out to be brought in. And she hid away. There was no friends in the cleft of the rock. But she knew if she was going to become a turtle dove, she would have to hide in the Word. She would have to get into the Word. She would have to depend on that cleft of the rock. And another way she got there, she hid in the stairs. You know what that means? The upward journey. The stairs go up. 
She had to forget her friends and her family hide in the cleft of the rock and get on the upward journey. And that brought her to the level of a turtle dove. And then notice what he says. Let me see your face. I found that to be interesting. Why does he want to see her face? Let me hear your voice. Why, Lord? Because I'm looking and listening for something. Because your face, your countenance will tell me what's in your heart. How you're talking will tell me if you've been in the cleft of the rock. Come away, my love. But before you do, look at me. I want to see if you've got a stiff neck or if your face is down. I want to know if you got fear in your face or faith in your face. I want to know if you got worry in your eyes or worship in your eyes. Look at me, my beloved. Your face will tell on you. Do you know when I walk in this church on the Sabbath, there's some folks' face I won't look at. It tells me you hadn't been in the clefts of the rock. <laughs> but Brother Vaughn, I'm worried. Doves don't worry. Doves are hidden in a safe place. Doves are in a cleft of the rock. Let me see your face. You'll never know when my world's falling apart because my face won't tell it. My face will tell you all is well. I serve a mighty God. I walk in faith. I hide out in the cleft of the rock. I hide in the stairs. Let us stand tonight and let us show him our face. Let us show him our face tonight. All is well. All is well. All is well. He said, let me hear your voice. I want to hear how you're talking about people. And I'll know if you've been in the cleft. Let me hear how you're complaining. And I'll know if you've been in the cleft. Show me your face. She was holding her head down. That's a good thing. That's submission. And he says, now, you tell me you've been in the cleft of the rock. Look at me. Let me hear if you're telling people don't know how I'm going to make it. Let me hear if you're saying things like why would God allow that? I want to hear how you're talking. Because I'll know by your face and your words if you're ready to come away with me. He's looking at your face tonight. Show me your face. Talk to me. Because I know when you start talking who you are. It is well with my soul. 